Hello and welcome to another video from Ellensburg Amplifier Repair and Service here in Central Washington. My name's Todd. And today we have a JL Audio RD500 by one amplifier sent in by a customer for repair. And I told him I'd get a video done on this. So I hopefully everything's coming out nice and clear on the video. Uh, just to let you know, vi you know, recording videos, the struggle is real. I, I've, I've had a heck of a time from day one uh, with lighting and I, I, I've never, I just cannot find a happy spot for lighting. So uh, please excuse any glares that you may have coming off the board. Uh, but this board does have a power supply failure. Uh, it uses the 3205s, 47 ohm gate resistors, and a couple buffer transistors with some 10 ohm inline resistors that we are going to replace today on uh, camera for you. I have already checked the output section of the board. The output transistors are okay. There's no shorts there. Uh, the really the only damage was it did have a significant failure um, across the original 3205s as you can kind of see in this picture here burnt up so I went ahead and pulled that off camera to save you guys from the boring stuff so I try to answer questions the best I can but Everyone, please remember that people that watch my videos, there's a wide range of knowledge um, across the audience. So when I answer one particular question, it may not make sense to a hundred other people. So when I speak of terms, I speak of in terms that hopefully people can understand. Um, so sometimes I might use terms that are not... Uh, what I like to call politically correct. But uh, today what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and replace these buffer transistors. These transistors are responsible for pulling the gate of the 3205s um, to ground and of course to the source voltage. So you have a signal coming in from the SG30... What is this? The... Yeah, standard JL. It's a 3525. I just had to double check uh, on this board because it is this looks the same size as like a 494, but I don't think I've ever seen JL use a 494. So it does give the pulse with modulated signals out to these buffer transistors through these 10 ohm gate resistors. You do have some smoothing here. You have a capacitor here, probably more than likely going to ground just to get rid of any noise in the signal path. And then one of these transistors is probably connected at 12 volts, and the other one's going to be connected to ground. Uh, you want to make sure that that gate gets pulled to ground as quick as possible without putting too much of a load on the drive itself. Otherwise, this is really a straightforward repair. This particular JL, the RD500 by one is not as complicated as some of the other release of JL audio amplifiers. Uh, that's why I'm kind of particular on the jail amplifiers that I receive in for repair. Some are much harder to diagnose than others. So excuse the noise that's going to be going on here. I'm just going to get some equipment going. So as I can remove the surface mount components. Um, as I've stated in the past, usually what I do before I even disassemble an amplifier is I write down the numbers. 2A, 1A, 2A, uh, and the 10 ohm 0805 resistors in the uh, area that they are going to be coming out so I know what goes back in. If you start pulling components here and you forget what went where or you don't quite understand what an NPN or a PNP transistor is or how it is installed in the circuit, you may have a hard time putting the amplifier back together. And then I, you know, get questions on, well, how do I do this? How do I do that? Uh, which I don't mind answering. It's just sometimes just having, you know, taking your notes before you disassemble an amplifier does help reduce any uh, potential issues. So 
I'm going to go ahead and remove the components, the surface mount components here. I do have the components laid out and ready to go. I do have everything. I've got my 3205s. I've got my four 10 ohm 0805 resistors. I've got the uh, 1A and 2A. Now, uh, one of the things I wanted to bring up in this video was the markings of these transistors. I get a lot of questions about markings of transistors. So there's two particular websites that I use uh, for transistor identifications. So one of these transistors is marked as a ZC. Uh, this one is a ZC right here that I'm pointing to with the tweezers, and this one is a ZC. You can't read it because it burned it up, but luckily one of the surface mount transistors is uh, legible, and the other one right over here, you can just barely read, but it is legible. So, when you're looking for identifications of transistors, it's always best to have, make sure you have the websites on hand that are uh, the best resource in my opinion to have the website address there's it's smanuals.com slash smd and you get a whole chart here so i'm looking for a zc so down at the bottom here i'm going to click on zc and it's going to come up with a kind of a small list here <clears throat> excuse me and one of the more common uh, numbering lettering systems is the MMBT uh, type transistors. So we have a ZC here, a SOT23, which that's what we have on the board is a SOT23. And there's the picture that you can hover over to kind of help match that picture. MMBT3904, again, remember, we're talking about the ZC. Uh, it's an NPN transistor, and you can click on the data sheet. which will pull up the data sheet for that ZC. Now what I'm looking for when I'm doing this is I want to just double check that the MMBT3904 has the same marking as what I have on the board. So I'm just going to scroll down through the data of this particular transistor. It's a 40 volt, 60 volt, 300 milliwatt transistor, but I'm interested in the markings of this. And we'll know here in a second why I'm after the markings of this. So again, remember that MMBT marking is pretty standard across the board when it comes to SMD components on a, with amplifier repair. So I'm just, oh, there we go. So down at the bottom, and some of these markings you'll find in the data sheets at the top or at the bottom, uh, somewhere on the data sheet, you may or may not find it. Most data sheets have the markings. So device marking MMBT3904 is equal to a 1A, 1AM, or ZC. And the reason why I am bringing this point up is that I have 1As and 2As, which are the MMBT series of transistors. So the ZC in reality is a 1A, which is the reason why you will see on my uh, note that I made, I wrote it down as a 1A and 2A, because I had already cross-referenced the ZC to a 1A, which tells me that my 1A here is correct for the ZC. So that's just kind of a really quick overview of hunting down transistor types. Uh, now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes it's not that easy. But most times, if you have the right resources, you can find what transistor it is. And I can already see it. I'm going to be getting questions about NPN and PNP transistors. But uh, please, you know, if you have a moment, just I'd be researching 
of how a transistor works, how it functions, what is an NPN and what is a PNP, and kind of get an idea how it's used in circuits. Otherwise, I could spend hours trying to explain how this stuff works. So just kind of keep in mind, one's connected to 12 volts, one's connected to ground. So I'm just going to go ahead and fire up the heat gun. You might hear it in the background, a little bit of noise here. I'm just going to pull these components off real quick here. And hopefully uh, the pads of these components aren't welded to the transistor, which uh, has happened several times. They do kind of tend to weld themselves to the pad if they get hot enough. So that's just something you want to keep in mind when doing this kind of work. Is to not pull up on the transistors too hard. You never know when they are welded to the pad. And when I mean welded, they're literally welded. The tab of the transistor is welded to the copper trace. And all these old components, as long as they're not used, will slide right off the board. So there's all the components removed, the surface mount components. Now remember this other. Sorry, I'm just, hopefully that noise isn't too bad coming across the microphone or the hot air gun cooling down. Um, but remember this had a pretty significant failure. So another thing I want to check is I want to check and make sure that my capacitors, probably bypass capacitors, Oh, sure is, yeah. I'm just, just verifying with myself what this capacitor is doing, and this capacitor is connected to ground. So it is a filter capacitor. So I just want to make sure that these are not short. These MLCC capacitors do have a tendency to short. Uh, under high faults, the layers in there will short together. So I'm like 150 mega ohms on this capacitor. 150 mega ohms. And this capacitor here. It's charging. So this one might already be charged. I remember capacitors uh, kind of shows a short when they're discharged and when they're charging. There we go. And this one's charging also. That's pretty, pretty sizable capacitor there. Um, of course, too, it is going through the gate circuit, so it's probably also charging some capacitance across the gate circuit. But I don't show a short, uh, or a capacitor that's shorted will show as a, uh, a dead short or a low resistance value. So now we just got to do is just clean all these pads up. So I'm just going to fire up the iron here. And I'm just going to lay down just a little bit of flux. This is lead-free solder that's on these boards, so sometimes just adding a little bit of flux will help your uh, braid take up this lead-free stuff. We all love lead-free solder. I know we do. Right? We wouldn't be using it if we didn't love it. I was kidding. Kidding, of course. Kidding. I'm going to try not to drag all these cords across the camera.
and it takes just just a second just to wick up that lead free stuff make all the surfaces flat uh, flat surface is the easiest surface to reattach components especially when it comes to SMD stuff I like to make sure everything's flat makes my job easier it's got to be easier because I have so many amplifiers I got to get done at the time of this recording uh, it's a, there's a gathering I think it's called it's down in Surf City I think it's called down in Oregon that everyone has been getting ready for so I have been extremely busy trying to keep everybody happy getting their amplifiers ready for surf uh, so they can do well and Now these pads that are connected to the ground plane take a little bit longer to heat up to pull off that lead free solder. But otherwise, just as simple as that, all the pads itself are level, flat, all that lead free garbage is pulled up. And then from here, what I'm gonna do is I'm just going to reinstall the components so I think what I'm doing is I'm going to clean up the old flux first with my trusty q-tip this also I can go by feel to make sure everything is nice and flat let free solder is picked up you all know me gotta be clean looks fantastic all right so let me get my 10 ohm 0805 resistors peel it back get them down on the mat here Probably hear the dogs snoring in the background as usual. Gotta love those animals Just laying around, sleep, snoring. So let's see your resistor, resistor. I'm just gonna use a little bit of flux, kind of just kind of glue it in place, keep them from floating around too much. Just plop those resistors right into place. Ah, upside down can't have upside down resistors i have seen that numerous times on cards output cards where they'll re they'll flow solder resistors but they'll flow them upside down <laughs> so to know the value you have to desolder it flip it over to read the resistance value all right so those are in place uh, And we will tack them down. And then I just do them all one at a time. So what I'll do is I will put some solder on one pad just a little bit and it'll the resistor will just kind of find its way to the soldering iron and it'll pull it in place.
and then I use the uh, just the surface tension of the solder and the and the flux just to kind of pull that resistor right where I want it. And there's one at a time. So that's kind of kind of the roundabout. What's the term? Gist of uh, repairing electronics is getting your own technique down. You'll have to excuse this soldering iron as I got to kind of reach around the snubber resistor here. Uh, It's all about finding technique. What works for you? Uh, what works for the customer? Knowing your customer base and how they respond with your work. Yeah, just the essence of business. And then once you get your own technique down, then you really start to uh, decrease the time it takes to do amplifier repairs so let me grab the transistor so this is the 2a and the 2a is going to go I, since i already had them laid out the two hold on Since I already had the transistors laid out on my little map that I made, I know exactly where the 1As and the 2As need to go. And the other 2A. The other 2A. And then the 1As. So you're probably wondering, well, how did I know it was a 1A that goes in the other locations? Well, if you Google complementary, just use the word complementary, you're going to find search results that will come up with the complementary of the transistor. So most, not all, transistors, uh, the PNP will have a complementary NPN. Now, I said not all, I said most. Oh, that one just flung away on me. Uh, where'd it go? There it is. Um, if there's no listing for a complementary, then you got to kind of go by what the uh, specifications of the transistor is. So, yeah, that's the uh, long way of finding the complementary is just knowing the specifications. <clears throat> Excuse me. And this is kind of the same same thing i have flux laid down so i'm just going to use my iron to kind of drag that transistor where i want it and put it in place and then i'm just going to do that for all four transistors So then I'm going to solder them, of course, straight onto the board. There it is. All the SMD components are soldered in place. Are any of them crooked? Let me double check. I don't like things that are crooked. I do have some uh, resistors that I am not happy with. So, you know me. Got to make sure they're straight.
And since this is leaded solder, it'll move around much easier than the lead free. And you'll see that these re resistors just fall into place. The uh, transistors. The resistors, they all line themselves up. There we go. Now we have straight, straight transistors and resistors. So the only thing left to do for this is to install the new 47 ohm gate resistors. Uh, 47 ohms is pretty common to drive the 3205s depending on the drive type, what's used in the drive. And I like to make sure all my color bands are the same direction. So... In my opinion, it's just, you know, professionalism, making sure everything's straight, making sure everything is in the right direction. Or not right, there's really no right or wrong when it comes to resistors, but at least everything's lined up in the same way. Just like that. I will push the resistors down. where they're flat with the board. Then I take the legs and, and I will bend them right on over. So let me just bring the camera up a little bit for you guys there so you can kind of get a better idea what I'm doing with these. I'll just bend them over and then wipe off all the nasty flux. And solder the gate resistors in place. I know the board, bottom side of the board is a little dirty here. I haven't cleaned it up quite yet because I still have the 3205s. I got to solder into place and uh, there's going to be a little bit of flux involved when that's all when that process is done so i will clean this up all at the same time and then i'll cut the legs off of that and put the legs in the garbage pile All right. Set you up for there's not as much glare on that. Get this to focus where I want. There's still quite a bit of glare there. And then we'll clean up that flux again. With some isopropyl alcohol and the trusty Q-tip. And you can see right there on the trace, that little shiny spot, maybe if the glare wasn't so bad. It's kind of hard to see on the camera, but it got so hot that some of the uh, 
silk screen got kind of peeled up which is normal that's that's normal on a fault uh, to lose some of that silk screen so no big deal it's not a concern do it without breaking the snubber net or the snubber resistor there Flux is pretty nasty. Not nasty, it's just messy stuff. And this is Amtec, Amtec Flux, so it's a, it's a pretty decent Flux. Uh, it does the job uh, that I need it to do. Some people probably don't prefer it, but I do for what I, what I work on, so... It is just kind of messy. Then from there, I think really it's just um, hooking up some power and seeing if the, I'm not sure if the drive will try to start without the board attached, the input board and the, uh, oh, good old JL here. Hold on, let me try to get this. I'm not sure if this is going to try to show me that we have any drive. We're going to find out though, just real quick like. Well, yeah, let's see if I can get a connection here. There we go. All right, let's see. Will this thing try to give me a drive without the boards attached? How about, how about no? It's not going to. Yeah, I gotta have the daughter board attached to it to try to get this thing to build drive here. Let me see if I can round that up. All right, I got the daughter board. <laughs> I just wanted to show. This daughter board is something else. I, there's some work I'm going to do on this board uh, before it goes back together because this literally wiggles in the pins in the socket. So that cannot, that can't be really a good connection. So um, let's see if this thing will start. without the RCAs. Yeah. Sorry, JL, not a fan of this design. Uh, let's uh, try this again. Will it try me? How about no, it won't. It has to have the uh this this thing's got to be almost practically put completely together i just can't believe that hold on
This is JL. Does this have the remote sense? Oh, it does. Oh, okay. Hold on. I got to switch this. Uh, so it's a remote. So this is typical JL stuff here. I have to change the switch uh, to remote sense. To remote. Oh, there it is. All right. I think it was on. It was on audio sense. Was it? It was on. Yeah, it was. It was on signal sense. So now, JL, will you try to give me a drive? Oh yes. Oh, and what is it you guys don't have? You guys don't have the scope. All right, there's our scope of the day there for you. Now I'm going to put my probe and see what we got going. All right, guys, you'll see the scope in the upper left-hand corner there. And we're just going to just make sure that this drive is functional. Uh, sorry, I had a little glitch in my software. I had to restart everything. so. As you can see, there, that's what we're after. The drive is present on the screen. Let me make sure that we have drive on all four transistors. One, two, three, and four. So the transistors are functioning. There's no ringing, no overshoots. That is a square wave exactly like I would like to see it. And you guys notice something about this particular RD500 amplifier by JL Audio is it does not go into shutdown if there's no rail voltage. Because you see the power supply here is maintaining the, the drive. So this does not have the same processing, I should say, as the other JL amplifiers where if you start it up, you know, it, doesn't see rail it may turn off uh, I don't know I don't know if I really ever paid attention that JL will uh, go and shut down if it does not see rail voltage but there's no rail voltage so you know none of the outputs going to be switching because like, there's no there's no plus minus anything control voltage or nothing so this is just to show that we have drive before we install the 3205s so that will allow me to get the power supply driver transistors installed. So I'm going to take my 3205s and I'm just going to pinch the legs just slightly. I'm going to pinch them together. Uh, what that's going to do is discharge the capacitors. Huh use my tweezers discharge the capacitors i wasn't worried about current because these capacitors aren't the biggest about so i didn't think it would melt my tweezers but i do not like to install new components if there's capacitance available because you could damage uh, the gate path of the transistor in my opinion, the most sensitive part. So I'm just sliding these down to the same level, the same height as the rectifiers. Making sure they're straight up and down and they're at the, all at the same height. And then I'm just going to solder the gate 
of each transistor with my soldering iron and not with my uh, FR301 just to set these in place. I know, sorry guys, you have a straight down shot on top of those transistors, so you really can't see how I'm reaching around the front here to solder these, but it'll give you kind of a kind of an idea of how I do this. It's easier to do the gate leg of the transistor because it has the least amount of thermal mass within the the die itself. So. And I just use that flux just to help pull that solder down through the uh, via. And now what I'll do is I will fire up the uh, 301. I'll flip the board over. And I see I might be slightly out of focus. And now I'll use the 301 the good old Hacko FR301 to solder the pins down of the pins, legs of the transistors. What would you call these on these? Legs, pins. And why do I use the 301? It's got a little bit more heat to it. And it allows me to spend less time on the VIA. You can get some pretty significant via damage if you get the via too hot. In other words, if you sit on there too long, uh, you could damage the via. Which then, of course, takes a little bit more work to uh, resolve the problem. Just like that. I'm going to cut the back of these legs off. I'm going to use my tweezers to go ahead and pull up some of this foam. This is what my mat leaves behind when I do some SMD work with the hot air gun. Kind of a, leaves a gooey mess. And then some isopropyl alcohol to clean up the rest of that flux. So this is the, really the, the repair of this JL amplifier. Uh, with these transistors in, it will attempt to build rail voltage and since I had already went through and verified that I didn't have any shorts in the output, uh, I have no doubt in my mind that this will start up and continue to function for the owner as intended. Make sure there's no solder bridges between your uh, solder points here. I've seen that happen many, many times where uh, people will be uh, chasing a no power issue when in reality it came down to a solder bridge that got left behind. So it's good practice to make sure your connections are Bridge free. All right, there's that. Shall we give it some power? I think it'll burn up on me. Go into protect. 
make sure all the gains, all your potentiometers are fully counterclockwise. That's just a, one of my best practices that I like to do is to make sure everything is down so I don't get any thermal runaway on a transistor if it so happens to come to that point. What was positive? The, this was positive and this was negative. All right, give it some power. Now this time what I'm gonna do is I am going to probe the output of the uh, amplifier. I'm gonna multitask here real quick. Since I can't seem to find my clip, oh, those things run away on me all the time. You know, the top that snaps onto the, uh, <laughs> Under the probe, I'm always having to hunt them down. I'll take them off, I'll put them on the on the desk, and they just kind of roll away on me. I the LED is underneath, so I really can't see what's going on down below. And we do have it goes to negative rail pretty quick. Let me get this focused focused. Let me get the voltage settings right on this. Pretty sure that I'm gonna need to be able to see the low side drive. All right, and I did that just really quick because again, you don't want thermal runaway. You'll you know, you'll never know without using a thermal camera if you don't have thermal runaway. So I I've got alligator clip in one hand, I've got test probe in the other. So I don't have a third hand to really run my thermal camera, uh, and I don't have one mounted above me looking down because it doesn't help anyways. Because you really want to look at the front of all these, but just to show you on the scope there that we do have low side drive there's your low side drive it's not I don't have my trigger set down there uh, so you'll s probably won't see it as clear but let's check the high side drive and there's your high side drive so this amplifier is back up and running uh, I really can't say 100% yet because it's not load tested. I will get it put back together and get it on the load bench with the other amplifiers that need to be tested today and we'll get this tested. So there's the repair of a JL Audio RD500 by one amplifier. New 3205 transistors in the, out, or in the power supply. We have new gate drivers, new gate resistors minus my hair, uh, new buffer transistors. Again, those are connected between ground and, and 12 volts more than likely, uh, which swings that drive all the way up and all the way down. Um, I may be wrong on that, hold on. It's probably not. It may be just, uh, they may not go to ground. I could be completely wrong on that. Oh, no. Uh, oh, no, it does. Okay, so we do have one that goes to ground through a 10 ohm resistor. All right. Um, yeah. I was just double checking my information that I was giving you guys. Because uh, this is the first RD style amp that I've had in, so... And then we replace the SMD resistors to restore the power supply on this back the way it should. So I do thank you guys for watching. Uh, if you like this kind of content, please like and subscribe. Leave your comments down below. And of course, as usual, I'll get to you as soon as I can. And today's safety tip, as always stated, please watch the rail voltage. These are relatively small-ish capacitors they are still 3300 microfarads up to 63 volts um, you can still you know get a 50 volt punch so again watch the rectifiers keep your fingers away from those if you have charged rails and stay safe out there thanks for watching guys we'll catch you on the next one